Now, I want to move on to Africa. Um, the challenges there are no less daunting. Um, conflicts there have had, continue to have, enormous economic, social, and human costs. Uh, Somalia has been in perpetual conflict for 17 years. Uh, our Prime Minister recently described Darfur in Sudan as a tragedy of colossal proportions, with more than 100,000 civilians forced to flee from violence this year, that's this year, and a staggering 25,000 in the week of the 14th of April, one week, one week in April alone. The war in the Democratic Republic of Congo has been devastating, leading to more deaths than any other conflict since the Second World War and drawing in forces from neighboring states. So that's what we're dealing with. Um, my government, like many others, uh, wants to improve things in Africa. We want to prevent and, and resolve conflicts, promote democracy, good governance and, uh, and human rights, and create the conditions for sustainable development. That includes improvements in public health, and here I'd like to uh, mention, as uh, John did earlier, the Carter Center's remarkable work on uh, guinea worm disease. When the center's program began, there were three million cases of guinea worm disease per year in over 20 countries. Today, uh, thanks to this center's lead, it's on the brink of being eradicated. Um, and I'm pleased to say, uh, as you did, um, that the UK has been a, been a partner in this work and helped with the funding for the last decade. In July 2005, uh, the leaders of the G8 group of countries met at Glen Eagles in Scotland under um, Tony Blair's chairmanship. Um, uh, this was one of those G8 summits which was the focus of a great deal of public uh, debate leading up to it, and millions around the world campaigned on the theme of Make Poverty History. At the summit, uh, a wide range of commitments were made, wrung out of the leaders, to tackle world poverty, notably a $50 billion uh, commitment of new aid, including $25 billion for Africa. Three years on, a great deal of progress has been made. Um, just to give a few statistics, um, 38 million more children of primary school age are enrolled in sub-Saharan Africa today compared with uh, a decade ago. 22 countries have now had all debts to the World Bank, uh, IMF and African Development Fund cancelled under the Debt Relief Initiative, which we uh, organised that year. The number of people living with HIV and AIDS receiving treatment rose tenfold in sub-Saharan Africa in the last three years. So things are moving for all the problems and the, um, and the um, um, uh, disturbing news that one sometimes hears. As I said before, our engagement in these issues is not only altruistic. There are good reasons of national security for us to get involved. For example, the, a number of those who were involved in the London bomb plots in 2005 were of, uh, were of Somali origin, and a third of the hard drugs that reached the UK uh, come via Africa. So um, we simply can't afford, whatever our moral view, we can't afford to turn a blind eye in the UK to Africa's problems, and we don't. I want to go on to talk specifically about two particular um, problem subjects, problem countries, um, Darfur and Zimbabwe. Darfur is a tragedy that's affected over 4 million people and drawn in neighboring states. Some 290,000 Darfuri ref refugees are in Chad, and as we can see from the recent attack by Darfuri rebels on Khartoum and the attack by Chadian rebels on N'Djamena earlier in the year, this conflict is destabilizing not just Darfur, uh, not just the rest of Sudan, but the whole region. And tragically, the, the security and humanitarian situations in Darfur are deteriorating, um, with Sudan and Chad in what some are calling a proxy war. Now, we want the people of Darfur to have the chance to rebuild their lives, and as the first steps, we want to see an immediate uh, cessation of hostilities and implementation of an enhanced ceasefire. Cooperation with the AU and UN to ensure the rapid deployment of an effective peacekeeping force, this uh, much talked about hybrid force, UNAMID. Or rebel groups engaged in the AU UN led political process, and all the parties allowing immediate access for humanitarian groups and respecting their responsibility under international law to protect civilians. The UK has offered to host peace talks in London. 
and we welcome the UN's plans to expedite the deployment of the UNAMID force and get 80% of it on the ground by the end of this year. And we've encouraged uh, our partners, our other member states, to help with the force's air and ground transportation needs. That force needs to be allowed to do its job, protect the people of Darfur and the humanitarian agencies which are working there. And we believe that if any party obstructs that effort, they should face the threat of tougher UN measures. Um, at the root of this, our belief is that the AU's involvement, both peacekeeping and political, um, and the difficulties we've seen in their ability to deliver a force, highlights the underlying need to build up African capacity. The G8 countries committed themselves last year at the last G8 summit to continue to assist the African Union in developing its capacity for uh, promoting and maintaining uh, peace and stability. The UK has invested um, uh, um, uh, funds of its own in building the conflict prevention and peacekeeping capacity of the AU and have helped in a number of practical ways, vehicles, fuel, salaries, food, and we've provided military planning expertise to the AU, including our own uh, personnel. And we've worked on a national level with the Nigerian and Ugandan armed forces. Um, often, the international community uh, is taken by surprise by a conflict. Sometimes that conflict unfolds in slow motion before us, uh, and Zimbabwe is unfortunately such a case, an internal conflict which is now destabilizing its neighbors. We've all been shocked to see the violence being perpetrated in South Africa against some of the estimated three million Zimbabweans who've taken ref uh, refuge there, but the root of that violence lies in the appalling situation in Zimbabwe itself, which has forced so many people from their homes. Zimbabwe has many problems to deal with, including the fact that about a fifth of the population is affected by HIV. But its biggest problem, uh, problem uh, is a government which has mismanaged a prosperous uh, economy so comprehensively that inflation is now officially over 165,000%. And the economy, particularly agricultural production, has shrunk by over 50% since 1996. A quarter of the population have voted with their feet and left the country. Uh, so the conflict that we're now seeking to prevent is driven by the attempts of the regime to cling on to power in the face of a popular opposition. And our task as an international community is to support free and fair elections and to create the conditions for a peaceful transition to a new and democratic government. And again, we come back to this issue of the capacity and will of African countries being absolutely crucial here. We hope to see the SADC and the African Union election observers uh, on the ground uh, in hundreds. Since the first round of elections in March, human rights abuses and attacks on and murders of political opponents have multiplied. And that tragedy, in our view, just has to stop. So um, we want to see the 27 June presidential runoff meet the electoral standards of the SADC. Uh, we want every Zimbabwean vote to be counted, and we want the will of the, of the Zimbabwean people to be respected. And we look in particular to the SADC, the Southern African Development Community, to ensure that this upcoming vote is free and fair. Only then can Zimbabwe start to pull back from the brink of internal conflict, as Kenya did earlier this year, and start to build for a better future. The UK, along with the rest of the international community, is, supported, is committed to supporting recovery in Zimbabwe when conditions on the ground uh, allow. That can't happen until the will of the people is respected and democracy is returned. But when that happens, we will be ready to respond um, to that new situation. So let me conclude by just saying that conflict prevention, resolution, management are rarely easy, but the costs of doing nothing are actually higher. And the UK is uh, an unapologetic activist on these uh, issues um, in the international community. And in the years ahead, we want to strengthen both our international institutions and, above all, our capacity and our political willingness to deal with conflict and with violence. With that, I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you.